Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Good to have you in church on a Wednesday night. We have a few people that even tried to get here tonight, and the flooding would not let them here. 152. Uh, all this snow and rain, and uh, Brother Eric Jones and them are watching online tonight. They tried many different ways to get to church this evening, and roads are closed. Uh, thankfully, you're able to get here, and uh, we have others that are in need of prayer tonight. Let's stand together right now. We're going to go ahead and take up uh, our, our prayer request time here in this service um, Brother Michael Green has uh, been transferred to a hospital this evening. Uh, EKG came back very, uh, it came back irregular, and so uh, they're going to be doing COVID testing and all kinds of stuff on him tonight. And uh, so we just need to pray for Brother Michael Green. He was here at prayer meeting last night uh, and told me he was having some blood pressure problems and uh, had asked for a prayer. And uh, we've been praying for him last Sunday. Had just a lot of pain, um, and um, he, he, it's normal for him to have that pain in his shoulders. And uh, says sometimes, you know, after working a full week, it's just really hard. And so we're praying for him tonight. He's in need of prayer. Also, Ruth Allen is continuing to need our prayers as well as uh, Eddie Ainsworth. Eddie Ainsworth had a heart attack, and uh, we're praying for him. They've done a procedure, and uh, Eddie is Brother Ainsworth's son. And so we're praying for uh, this gentleman tonight. These are needs that have been given to us before service. Um, you know, sometimes we don't necessarily do prayer requests on Wednesday night, but when you have this many needs that are coming to you right before church, it's probably good for us to pause a moment and pray for these needs. So would you do that with me right now, Lord? We know you're able to touch. I thank you, Lord, for a great prayer meeting last night. And God, the presence of the Lord that continues to move in this house. Every time we gather together, we know, Lord, you're with us and that you're moving among us. And we pray tonight, oh God, that you would use this service to reach your intended purpose, God. I pray for these needs, Brother Michael Green in the hospital tonight, in need of the touch of healing for his body. I pray, O oh Lord, for Ruth Allen this evening. I pray, God, for Eddie Ainsworth. I'm asking, Lord, that you would move individually in these needs, God. You know what needs to be done. We give these situations to you, and we believe for a miracle. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, would you give the Lord praise all across this place today? Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You can be seated. Ushers are coming tonight. Thank you so much for being here at Harvest Church on Wednesday night. We're going to talk about tonight the boy who heard God's voice. I believe we are able to hear the voice of God today, and we can learn things from this story. And, and uh, some of these things that I, I began to see in this story um, just kind of really hit home with me, and you're probably going to feel that at certain points. And uh, I will probably make some comments. You'll go, wow, that, that may have just hit a little close to home. I, I really... Uh, believe the Word of God speaks to us right where we are right now. It's not a book of history, but it's, it is kind of history, but it, it's more than just that. It is a road map for our lives today. It's not just to see what God did yesterday, but it's to give you faith to know God can do it for you right now. We're going to get to Sunday school tonight. We're going to worship together. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's worship together as they serve you. Cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. 
your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, reign over me. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, reign over me. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, reign over me. Over all the earth we're singing, you reign, justice and peace you bring in, you reign, holy one, you reign. You reign, over all the earth we're singing, you reign, justice and peace you bring in. Holy one, you reign. Let's stand together tonight. Stand together all across this room. Somebody lift your hands. Lift your praise up to Jesus. He reigns in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated this evening. Thank you so much for worshiping in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. We welcome those that are joining us online this evening. And I failed to mention Sister Danielle. She had a uh, one of those uh, fun pregnancy visits today where they get to do the sugar test. And so uh, that's why she's not here tonight. Uh, kind of left her feeling yucky. And so they are watching online. We remember them as well uh, this evening. I want you to imagine with me for a few moments, you're going to be a kid tonight, okay? You're going to get to be a kid again. A few moments tonight that you're in Sunday school, and you're about seven years old. Anybody remember when you were seven years old? And uh, you don't have to admit it if you don't. Uh, And as usual, you know, as a seven-year-old kid in the Sunday school class, your mind is drifting and wandering from one thing to another. Maybe you weren't that way, but I was. You know, it didn't take much. Oh, there's a ladybug in the corner. You know, I, it didn't take much for me to kind of lose my focus. You're busy. You're fidgety. Well, I was. And uh, <laughs> you're not thinking much about the, what the teacher has on her mind. And then suddenly something catches your eye and the teacher brings in a series of posters. Large pictures. We still do this in Sunday school. One large picture after another and depicting stories out of the Bible. And she asks you to name the story by just looking at the picture. Now, you're going to have to use your imagination because I'm going to describe the picture to you. Play along with me as I describe this tonight. The first large picture she shows is a young man standing beside a fresh grave. He has blood on his clothes, a knife in his hand, and a guilty look on his face. He's speaking toward the sky with a shrug. What story is this? Cain and Abel. Very good, very good. Second, a series of of black cards darken the top of the poster, and the sea is turbulent with no hint of land everywhere in the distance. In the center of the picture, rather, you see a very large, crudely constructed barge-like boat. Anybody know what I'm talking about so far? Noah, I saw you mention it. I would have said, you know, a monkey sitting on a giraffe's head, but that would have gave you too much. And again, that's me going back to my seven-year-old mind, okay? Here's a third. (laughs) A mother standing waist-deep in a muddy river. She's placing her baby into a little handmaid. There you go. Some, you're already ahead of me. Read basket. You're saying it's Moses. That's right. And I've got one more. It's a young boy in a bed sitting up like something has just pulled him from his dreams. He's trying to wake up. His face reflects a mixture of confusion and concentration. And he has his head slightly tilted. Anybody say that? What? Samuel. Samuel. I love stories. I do. I love stories. And I said this. Uh, What I'm getting ready to say, I said kind of in a preview video on social media this week. I love stories about humble beginnings. Thank you, Sister McCoy, for that book that you brought me with the CEO from Hobby Lobby. I am thoroughly enjoying that book. Um, I enjoy books about CEOs and how they got started and even what what dictates their decisions in business making. And and I read a lot of those books and I'm constantly reading. Um, And so I enjoy those stories. I enjoy stories even about like unknown people. I, I really, had he not had Hobby Lobby, I would not have even recognized 
recognized his name. Uh, but I like stories like that. Every story has a setting, or at least it should. A story without context is like a diamond without a mounting. The stone may be beautiful just laying on a table, but if it's carefully mounted into the right setting, it will dazzle you with its brilliance and sparkling beauty. And that's why in each of these sermons, I'm taking a lot of time to give us context. I take a lot of time to tell the story. Because I think so many times, we just assume everybody knows the story. How many times have you ever heard a preacher preach and he goes, well, you know the story, and then he goes on. I'm trying not to do that, Brother Matthew, in this series because there's some fascinating stories that we want to make sure we know the details of, okay? So I hope I don't bore you or get started too quick because by the time I get to my three or four points to preach, I'm usually about 10 minutes away from closing by that point, okay? So uh, I, I'm, and then once we get through this series, I promise you, um, unless the Lord leads me otherwise, I'm feeling like I'm probably just going to be preaching a lot on Wednesday nights because I know it's hard. You've worked all day. And then sometimes it's the first time you get to sit down is on Wednesday night. So we're going to move our Bible study time to Sunday night to where uh, it's a little bit easier because we've been resting most of the day. It's easier to come in and uh, be able to do that. So uh, we need to understand the setting of the story we're talking about tonight. And Sister Wilkerson's up there by herself running the live stream and PowerPoint this evening. You can go ahead and put the first screen up. Uh, we're going to talk about the boy who heard God's voice or the boy who heard the voice of God. God. The setting is Israel before the glory days of King David. There has been a long period, a couple hundred of years, of uh, kind of cycles of events, warfare events that would take place. Israel would suffer invasion, then it would be followed by a famine, and then a judge would emerge and win a temporary peace. And during the peace, the people would sin, and the cycle would kick in all over again. Another invasion followed by defeat, resulting in yet another famine, growing more severe every time. And this story takes place during a lull in the violence, a restful season of relative peace. Days were unusually quiet, and they were pretty uneventful, to be honest with you. Uh, the people of Israel have settled back into a lax lifestyle that could be described as downright complacent at times. Their attitude toward God and His vision for them as a nation has become indifferent, a little ho-hum, a little boring, if you will. And their leader, the high priest, is Eli. He's an elderly man whose eyesight has begun to grow dim. Unless something changes, he will turn the reins of leadership over to his two rebellious sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who helped him minister in the tabernacle, which was the place of worship during this period of Israel's history. Now, there's more to the setting, so I want you to bear with me tonight. A few years earlier, a woman named Hannah was a regular visitor to the temple. She spent most of her time in prayer there begging God to give her a son. And she vowed to the Lord if, if He would just grant her request, she would give that boy back to Him. And the Lord did finally give her a son that she named Samuel. Appropriately, Samuel means asked of God. And soon after he was weaned, she fulfilled her promise and placed Samuel in the care of Eli, uh, the aging, almost blind high priest of Israel. Eli was responsible for Samuel's welfare. He was responsible for his education. He was tutoring him in spiritual things, preparing him for a lifetime of service to God. And so that brings us to our first scripture in chapter 3. The child Samuel in 1 Samuel 3 and 1 ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. The whole land of Israel, stuck in a political and spiritual situation, was half asleep, yawning its way from one day to the next. But God, in the scriptures, it seems as if he's silent. No one has visions except maybe a few charlatans. Meanwhile, Samuel still has a young boy, carries out his duties for the Lord under the watchful eye of Eli, a preoccupied grandfather type who's very kind, but he's, and he's gentle with him. And so whenever a story begins with a very 
uh, ultra calm setting, you can usually expect something is going to change very soon. And it does. It came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. Now when you study this, that's not supposed to happen. That is actually supposed to burn non-stop. And so it goes out and it says that's where the ark of God was. Samuel was laid down to sleep. The Lord calls Samuel and he answers, Here am I. Everything in the tabernacle revolved around the most holy place. This was where the sacred um, laser-like brilliance of God's presence would hover over the Ark of the Covenant. A place so holy that it was dangerous to just mere humans. A thick curtain divided it from the rest of the inner chamber where the implements of worship were located. And one of the special fixtures of the holy area was a menorah, which according to the law of Moses was to never go out. To keep the lamp supplied with oil around the clock, the priests, they would take turns sleeping near the most holy place to make sure that this menorah burned all the time. Eli and Samuel were probably taking their turns sleeping in the, in the tabernacle to keep this lamp lit. And they slept in little rooms or closets near the special area of God's presence. And it was when Samuel heard a voice call his name that he sat up in his little pallet and he called back, Yes? And no one answered. And so the Bible says in verse 5, he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, you called me. And he said, I didn't call you, son. Lay down again. And he went and he lay down. You can't always tell from Scripture whether God's voice is audible or heard by some other means. When Saul, later Paul, was on the road to Damascus, we know he heard the voice of the resurrected Jesus talking to him uh, in a vision. And the sound could be heard by those that were traveling with him. It was an audible voice that day. Uh, God's voice to Daniel, the Bible says, sounded like thunder. But centuries earlier to Elijah, he spoke with a noiseless sound. And in Samuel's case, God spoke in such a way that Samuel literally heard his voice. He spoke with the voice of a normal Hebrew man so that this boy thought it was actually Eli calling to him from the other room. Eli probably thought Samuel had been dreaming, so he sends him back to bed. The Lord, in verse 6, calls yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli like the obedient young man he was. And he said, Here am I, you called me. And he answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The last sentence represents the storyteller clarifying a comment to us, the reader who already knew of Samuel as a powerful prophet of God. It's the author's way of saying that this all occurred before the Lord had actually initiated a personal relationship with this boy. Now keep this in mind, as it will become very important in the rest of this story as it unfolds. By the way, in the Old Testament, having a personal relationship with the Lord in the way that we have come to know it, by the new covenant and the indwelling of His Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that was a rare and awesome privilege in the Old Testament. And I think that sometimes we take this privilege far too lightly. Remember, the opening verse of 1 Samuel 3 said, The word of the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were infrequent. I'm glad that we can gather together at least two times. Sometimes now it's going to be three times a week. And hear the word of the Lord, and God can speak to us. Hey, can I just give you a news flash today? If you'll open up your Bible, even in just a regular day, God will speak to you through His word. We don't understand what they were going through. The Bible says that that there's going to come a day where there is going to be another famine of the Word of God. We've got to develop a love for His Word that is greater than anything else. I'm not going to allow anything to get in between me and my personal walk with God and hearing the voice of God. That's why it's important. I put time on my schedule to read the Word of God. Somebody say amen. So because Samuel and God weren't yet on speaking terms, I don't mean that bad, but it just hadn't happened yet, everything the boy knew of the Lord came through Eli, not by personal experience. So before people had the Scriptures, the Lord would break the silence 
and speak audibly to a prophet or give direction from some supernatural source. But it had never happened to Samuel up to this point. He not only was inexperienced, he was confused. And he did the only thing a little confused boy knew to do, and that is run to an elder. (laughs) 1 Samuel 3 and 8, The Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose and went to Eli, and he said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived. That the Lord had called the child. Now, I am intrigued by that word perceived here. The Hebrew word involves a heavy element of skill, wisdom, by experience. You can't take a course in college to learn discernment. It comes through the passage of time. As you apply yourself to discovery, and sometimes it's by trial and error. Oh, come on. You ever thought you heard from God and then you stepped out and you went, well, wait a minute, that may not have been Him. I messed up. And I go back and I tell, okay, God, I thought that was you, but that was probably me. You know, we learn. But that happens more infrequ- that, that happens less frequently as we learn to discern how God speaks to us. Boy, it's getting quiet in here tonight. Apparently you ain't never tried to act on something you thought was God. But anyways... <laughs> Eli had never heard the voice of God for himself up to this point. And God's revelation in this way had not occurred for a very long time, according to 1 Samuel 3. He had come to know God very well. By the third time around, it became clear to him that this had to be the Lord's voice. And I appreciate his counsel to Samuel here. Look at this. Eli says to Samuel, I want you to go back and I want you to lie down and it shall be. If the Lord's the one that's calling thee, you just say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And so Samuel went and he lay down in his place. Now just imagine you're a young person working for someone who has years of experience in the ways of God. And that person you greatly respect says that's God's voice. And if you hear it again, you listen. Stay sensitive to what God has to say. And this must have been uh, very strange for a small boy to hear. But he obeyed, the Bible says, without hesitation. The Lord came in verse 10. He stands, calls as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Again, as a child in Sunday school, I remember seeing Bible posters on the walls of the classroom. Invariably, if I remember correctly, and and they don't change these pictures very often now. It's pretty much the same pictures as when I was even in Sunday school. And, And... It's the same painting of a little boy propped up on one elbow, tilting his head, and and, and, and he's, he's trying to hear the voice of God. The artist had drawn everything so perfectly that as a kid, sitting in that Sunday school classroom, I could almost hear the voice of God myself when that teacher would say, the voice of God said to Samuel, Samuel. And as a kid, that's why I had you do that with your imagination earlier. You're sitting in that room and it's almost like you hear it. I never will forget Sister Diane Reasons teaching this lesson. And she actually had somebody standing on the outside of the door. And when she said, God said, and somebody said, I mean, it forevermore shook us up. We was trying to figure out what was going on. It was a voice we didn't recognize. And so as a kid in Sunday school, I never will forget this story. Uh, In the silence of the bedchamber or in the rare silence of a Sunday school room that day, Samuel heard (laughs) these frightening words. Listen to this. Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. This message was a huge burden for an adult, much less a little boy. But tragically it was not something Eli had not heard before. God had pulled Eli aside on a previous occasion and he told him about his wayward sons. I want you to look at this in chapter 2. There came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, 
Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all thy offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat, with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in in thine house house forever. Now, if you're not familiar with the backstory, you may be wondering, well, my Lord, what is all this about? The short answer is this, two extremely wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli was a great preacher. He was a fine priest. And as the high priest, he was responsible uh, once every year to enter the most holy place and offer an atoning sacrifice on behalf of the nation. No one else had that privilege. He judged. He instructed the people in matters of worship. He gave counsel. He devoted his entire life to serving at the tabernacle of God and ministering to the needs of God's people. But he was a passive, inactive father who indulged his sons. As we say it in the South, those boys were a piece of work. Look at verse 12. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's customs with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the Bible says the priest's servants came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three-tenths in his hand. The author used similar words with little Samuel but with a very different emphasis. The word translated knew... They knew not the Lord. It's the same, but the context makes a very big difference. Samuel didn't know the Lord because of youthful ignorance. Hophni and Phinehas didn't know the Lord because they were willful, carnal reprobates. Morally, they were hollow. Or, in Seth Wilkerson's terms, they were spiritual losers. (laughs) Yet, they had been anointed priests. And the following is one example of how they would abuse their positions. Before they burnt the fat in verse 15, the priest's servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Now look at this. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But notice verse 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. According to the law of Moses, they were to burn the fat as an offering and take whatever did not burn from the altar. In this way, they were only to receive whatever the Lord provided for them. But Eli's worthless sons defied the instructions of God and they chose the choicest cut of meat for their dinner table. And that's bad. But it only gets worse, much worse. Verse 22, Eli's very old and he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation along with the audacious disrespect for the sacrifices of God. They were perverse men who took advantage of the women who came to worship. And they did so without shame right there in the house of God. And I don't know if that's any worse than what I'm about to say. Daddy knew it and yet did nothing. I'm not here to crucify Eli tonight. I'm here to teach us a principle from this story in just a minute. You would think that a genuine man of God, like Eli, would have been outraged. Remember, he also served as Israel's judge. 
meaning that his responsibility was to carry out justice on the behalf of God. And these sons of shameless lust should have been carried to the edge of town and stoned to death, to be honest with you, according to the law. And instead, they received a mild scothing. How pathetic is that? Look at verse 23. He says, why do you do this? I hear your evil dealings by all these people. Nay, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Meanwhile, in verse 26, the child Samuel grew on and was in favor, both with the Lord and also with men. It just gives me courage that when mankind can sometimes be boneheaded and make terrible decisions, God is still going to prepare for His church and make sure that the church keeps going on. Amen. Amen. And as difficult as it is to imagine, Samuel is raised up in this environment, but apparently he knew very little about it. And while Hophni and Phinehas turned the tabernacle into a chamber of unbridled lust, Eli kept one hand over Samuel's eyes and the other, it seems like, over his own. And God's patience finally reaches an end. And he's through talking to Eli about it. Instead, he would place his final word of judgment on the lips of an innocent little baby, in, or an in, innocent little boy. In that day I'm going to perform against Eli all things which I've spoken concerning his house. And when I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not and therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever Eli's behavior reflected his times politically socially and spiritually the nation would exist in a sluggish lazy complacency he folded his arms and thought well I just can't do a thing with these boys of mine Hophni I and Phineas have been rebellious all their lives and I'm so busy. I, I've got so many things to take care of. Surely God will understand. Oh no, God won't understand. And his anger has risen to such a level that he awakens a young boy in the tender years of childhood and ministry to tell him this warning that I'm giving you, I'm giving it to you so that you will know what is about to happen. Now, I don't know about you, but it would have been hard to go back to sleep that night. And the Bible doesn't say he went back to sleep. If you read verse 15, it says he lay until the morning. You ever had those nights where you laid until the morning? You really didn't sleep, but you laid until the morning, you know. If I move, I'm going to wake up somebody here in the house. I'm just going to lay here, you know. I don't want to get up and, and disturb Eli any earlier than I have to. I've got to deliver this message to him tomorrow. And the Bible says he lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel, really, he was scared to even tell Eli about his vision. And Eli calls Samuel in verse 16 and he says, Samuel, my son, and he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, do so to thee and more also if you hide anything from me, young man, of all the things that God said to you. In other words, I'm hungry for a word I hadn't heard from God in so long. Tell me what God told you. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Just as Eli requested. Samuel tells him everything that the Lord had said. He hid nothing from him. I am amazed by Eli's response. He says, in effect, well, that's the way it goes. The Lord knows what he's doing. How much better if he had finally took the Lord's warning seriously? How much better if he had stood to his feet and said, that's it, I've heard enough. I've done exactly what God says in the law not to do. I'm taking these boys to the elders of the city so that justice can be carried out. The years of my own negligence and the years of evil in the tabernacle, it's got to end right now. And when I die, I want to just die in obedience. But that's not Eli's style. He did the same thing on this day as he had been doing all those years leading up to this. Nothing. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing. <laughs> God has preserved for us some fascinating stories to leave us with life-enduring lessons. 
and fathers in particular, I hope you hear me in this room tonight, we must pay attention to this story. It has been my observation that Eli's paralysis of leadership is not uncommon even among those in ministry. And as a father whose vocation is service to the Lord as a full-time pastor, I've done a lot of soul searching this week because I didn't want to preach this message to you without me also looking at my own house. And I have made it my intentional mission to avoid the fa- being the father and the failure like Eli. That while I have been far from perfect, I have worked hard not to be passive. And to avoid his fate, every one of us today must recognize that our families can end up looking like Eli's if we don't do something about sin in our homes. And we must recognize that any family can come unraveled. I'm talking about an elder's family. I'm speaking about a pastor's family. We've seen missionary families. Same thing happen. We've seen rich people, poor, healthy people, strained people. I'm telling you, any family can end up like the family of Eli. But we've got to keep training our kids in the ways of God. We've got to keep them in the straight and the narrow. We've got to be quick to discipline where it is needed. I've seen people laugh at stuff that ain't cute. And I've got a little boy right now I'm having to watch real closely because he thinks everything's funny. And I'm teaching him, son, there's some things that ain't funny. This very week I had somebody standing here in the church house and I, maybe I'd just been reading too much about Hoffman and Phineas, but I, I was standing there and I was trying to talk to them. And that little knucklehead was doing everything he could that knew that he'd getting on my last nerve. And, and then he walked up and called him a name. And it wasn't even a bad word that he used. But the point is, we've been telling him, you don't call people names. He called him a name. I was standing in there in that foyer. I said, excuse me. And I walked right in here and he got the discipline he needed right here in this sanctuary. You say, well, that's just a little uncalled for. Of all things, that's in the church house. I refuse to raise a Hophni and Phineas. And I'm here to tell you tonight, we must take the house of God seriously. We must take our own houses seriously to where we realize little things start when they're young. I'm as busy as any pastor. But I want you to hear me right now. I hope you never feel bad at me for taking time to pour and invest into my children. There's a reason why I chose to homeschool them. Number one, I didn't need, I didn't need the truants officer showing up at my house because of all the church conferences we have to go to. And I don't leave my kids behind. They go to ministry events and so they would miss too many days of school. And that officer would be at my house wondering why my kids ain't at school. So that's number one, why I homeschool. Because they need education. Number two, I don't homeschool them because I'm scared to put them in a public school system. Because I've seen my own wife graduated from a public school system, had a walk with God doing so. I don't believe that you can't live for God and go to public school. But here's the deal. There's enough times that in the middle of the night I am called upon to help people in this congregation. The least I can do is spend part of my day with them teaching them not just the ways of God, but developing a relationship with them. That way, if I do get called out in the middle of the night, it's not we ain't seen Dad all day. And I have that luxury, and I realize not all parents that are even watching online have that. And so here's what I'm saying to all of us tonight is we must be careful that we don't allow everything else to push out time that we don't have time with our own kids. There's times where I'd rather go sit in my recliner and prop my feet up. Yet they'll bring me something and say, Daddy, can we play? Or can we go outside and throw the ball on the tip of my tongue? Is no, sir, no, ma'am, we can. I'm wore out. But I understand that we must pour into our kids before it's too late. we got to be quick to pull them back in line when they get out of line. Because kids grow up. And that's kind of what's wrong with today. <laughs> we got kids that didn't grow up that are voting. Owning weapons. You don't get what you want, you go get what you want. Whoa. We got kids raising kids today. And we wonder why the nation's in the shape it's in. 
<laughs> Don't slam the generation before you talk to the generation before. Make sure we taught our kids. Well, there's a whole lot of people that today, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I know there's a whole bunch of it in our congregation. We got a whole bunch of grandparents that are having to raise children, and that is not a knock on the grandparents. That's just saying this is showing us where we are as a generation today. When I talk to this school system, and, and, and I, I was like, why is COVID becoming such a bigger deal with our school system than others? Our girls' basketball team was six girls. That meant one girl sat on the bench. The rest of them were on the court. When we'd go play other schools, they'd have 15, 16 girls. And I'm like, I've got a roster of 20 girls. What's going on? And they'd tell me, Pastor, you don't realize these are all kids that live with their grandparents, and their grandparents are high risk, and they're scared to death of COVID and I began to realize we pastor in a community where it's a whole lot of grandparents that are having to raise kids because the kids are doing whatever they want to do huh. and this the warning signs are are so evident from Eli's family we can detect no less than four things that happen first Disintegrating families have parents who are preoccupied with an occupation to the exclusion of family needs. Eli was a busy priest. He was a respected judge. He was engaged in serving the public. We can be reasonably sure that if he weren't, God would have mentioned it in, the, in his warning. You've not been doing what you're supposed to do at the church house. You know, Public ministry, I do not get that public ministry was his weakness. The problem was he failed to give his boys the kind of attention that he gave Samuel. His sons were slowly eroding into a lifestyle of cynicism and skepticism. And Eli not only overlooked it, but he failed to discipline them. And yet, he did his job at church very well. The sons of Eli were sons of Belial. The Bible went as far as to say they knew not the Lord. Impossible. You might protest tonight and say, Pastor, that is impossible. But it's right here in the Bible. And so we are compelled to ask ourselves, how can that happen? And yet, Brother McKinney, you probably know him as well. We've all watched preachers' kids grow up and not know God when they reach adult years. And I'm just here to tell you tonight, if it ain't for nobody else, this message is for me to let you know. I refuse to let my kids grow up without knowing this God that we serve that moves in this house. I meant to put the picture in my PowerPoint, and I did not. And I will share it on our church Facebook page probably tomorrow and let you see it. It is a powerful visual. 40,000 hours. Let me pull it up so I don't misquote it here. 40,000 hours is what parents have with their kids every year. And they have this, this visual of, these ping pong balls in a big glass tube. There's 40,000 of them. And then they go on to say, the church, on the other hand, you say, I'm sorry, you have 3,000 hours a year. The church, on the other hand, has an average of 40 hours a year. And yet, how many kids, the only time they hear about God is when they walk through these doors. I'm not diminishing. I've got Sunday school teachers sitting in this room and I appreciate everything you do. You keep doing what you do. But I'm, I'm appealing to every parent and every grandparent that's having to raise kids tonight. Help us, God, to pour into those kids more than just when we come to church. We cannot rely on church to be the only place that they learn about God. These kids were born. They were brought up with the very precincts of the Lord's house. Were not the first sounds they heard the praises of God in His sanctuary? Were not the first sights they saw the Father in, in the robe beside the altar of all the tables and the bread and the sacrifices and the incense around Him? And this causes me to stop and challenge us tonight. Our children 
They see us serving the local church. My children see me studying scripture at home. They, they've seen me singing with great passion. They see Sunday after Sunday they've observed me in different tasks of ministry. And throughout the week they, they've heard the stories. My, my children have joined in the prayer times around the table. And while all of that is good, it would grieve me if that's all that they knew about their father. If they didn't know any part of my personal life uh, like they know the involvement of my ministry. I would be crushed uh, if that's all that they ever knew about me and to make matters worse they could not develop a strong love like mine for the things of God if they didn't realize there was other passions in my life but they were never as great as the passions of God that's exactly the way it was with Hophni and Phinehas all they saw was that God had their daddy busy and he was never home I'm here to tell you tonight we must make sure our children are not just involved in the church but that they are getting a love for God unlike like anything else. Come on, you can like other things, but there's one thing that you ought to love above those other likes, and that is the God of the house. That is the Savior that saved your soul. That is the one that loves you like nobody else can. Second, disintegrating families have parents, and I'm almost done tonight who refused to face the severity of their children's actions. Eli knew how horrible his sons had become, and yet he did nothing. Everybody say nothing. I've seen parents in such denial they couldn't bring themselves to admit their child had a serious problem with drugs or pornography or sexual promiscuity or, or stealing. And those behaviors that most of any other normal person would consider a red flag, it's hard for the parent to see that in their own kid, and yet they act as though the crisis will resolve itself if given a little patience. I've seen too many disintegrating families miss the warning signs, and so I have uh, even less reason to doubt the, re the, the reasoning or the wisdom of Proverbs 19 and 18. I want you to look at these words in several different translations. The NLT, discipline your children while there is hope. If you don't, you're going to ruin their lives. The TEV says, discipline your children while they're young enough to learn. If you don't, you're helping them to destroy themselves. The Message Bible says, discipline your children while you still have the chance. Indulging them destroys them. So if you have children who are young, you have children who are impressionable. And that's the time to make your most important investments into them. Let me just say this, to wait until they're as tall as you, you've already allowed them to self-destruct. <laughs> to wait till you can look them in the eye without having to get down on their level. You've waited too long. Praise God. Third, dis disintegrating families fail to respond quickly and thoroughly to the warning of others. Oh, I wish Brother Justin was in here tonight because I'm sure he would amen real loud here. Listen to their teachers. I know they may seem biased against your child, but they rarely are. We have to take the early reports seriously and get involved. Listen to your pastor. Listen to your youth pastor. Listen to the, un the, the, the uniformed officer with a badge that comes to your door. As soon as the door shuts, don't say, well, they're just taking it too far. Don't be so quick to jump to your child's defense. i got an officer here tonight, but at least take time to uh, hear the report in full. Ask direct and hard questions to be sure you have the full picture. And then I want you to take time to reflect on what you've heard. And if it resonates, causing you to think that it might be accurate, then you need to dig deeper and go whatever measure is necessary to make sure you have it resolved. Now, you can do this without being impulsive. Don't be like Eli. He didn't listen to the man of God who came to him in 1 Samuel 2, and he later paid dearly for his negligence. Lastly tonight, fourthly, and I'm done. Disintegrating families rationalize wrong behavior and thereby become part of the problem when they do so. Eli participated in his son's behavior. And we know this because Eli got fat on the food his boys had stolen from the altar. Look at this and try to imagine the scene that God paints. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and dishonorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Eli rationalized and excused the sins of his sons while eating meat that had been stolen from the altar. And as for Samuel, the boy who heard God's voice, the closing word of this episode tells us that sleepy spiritual indifference that had lulled Israel into complacency was about to come to a screeching halt. 
Samuel would rouse the nation from its slumber and call it to action. And the Bible says Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. A man of action was on the scene and Israel's spiritual drift was about to end even as a little boy. He had not only heard the Lord, but he obeyed his voice. And so, as we think about all of this, especially as we evaluate the condition of our own families, remember that hearing the truth is not enough. Action is essential. Only on the rarest occasions does the Lord bless someone just for listening to him. Many times he says, if you'll act on what I said, I'll do. That means his blessings almost always lie on the other side of obedience. According to Scripture, knowledge alone puffs up. But knowledge with action brings about humility. Besides, problems like those of Eli do not solve themselves. They multiply and intensify with the passing of time. If the willful acts of rebellion and carnal conflicts that you permit in your family are never resolved... They become unwelcome wedding gifts when your children choose to marry. And if you've reached the conclusion, maybe tonight you're watching online or you're sitting in this sanctuary and you've reached the conclusion, my family's in danger, please choose to do something rather than nothing. (laughs) Refuse to be like an Eli. In the end, after achieving public success in ministry, God looks at Eli and says, you're a failure at home. And ends up judging that family for it. Oh, I pray. God, don't let that be the case with any of us. Or any of our families here at Harvest Church. Why? Because we must hear the voice of God. And obey the voice of God. And if we don't, none of us are expendable. None of us are irreplaceable. Because God's church is going to move forward. It's up to me to be a part of it. He's going to have a church according to his word. He's coming back for a people who have made herself ready. The Bible talks about without spot, without blemish. Well, how do we get to that? We're not perfect. You said, Pastor, none of us are perfect. We keep ourselves under the blood of the Lamb. And when we find that there's areas in our family, like we talked about last week with Achan, we take control of that in our own house. and We repent of those things and then we guide, we direct. So I speak to every father in this room tonight. And sometimes it's it's difficult because now sometimes we have kids that have grown and moved out. You can't necessarily give that daily guiding influence, but when they come to you for advice, they're looking for that sure sound. They're looking for that godly advice that can still come from a father in their later years. I can't tell you how many times that I've called my dad saying, Dad, I don't know what to do. Sometimes it would be situations of my own making. I'd say, I know, Dad, you could say (laughs) you made the bed lay in it. But here I am, and I'm asking for your advice. There's been times, Brother White, where I've took his advice and everything came out great. There other times where I regretted not doing what he told me to do. Because at the time I looked at that and said, oh, I don't know. You, you're a long ways off. A lot of miles. You don't, you don't understand the temperature of this situation. But actually he was speaking through discernment, wisdom by experience. Why? Because he's been there before. It's funny, the older you get, the less dumb your parents seem to be. (laughs) You'll say, I'll never. Oh, God, don't ever say that. Don't ever. (laughs) And we say that humorously tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) 
we say that we say that tonight and we say you know it's kind of humorous but there are there are things that our parents have instilled in us that work its way to the top and not all of those are bad things the older we get the more we learn to be slow to speak Maybe a little bit slower to react. Now, I've learned at times where I've reacted, it didn't turn out as good. But if I stopped for a little bit and then I determined what my action should be, it wasn't a reaction to what was going on. But then as I take my time and I say, okay, God, I need to know what to do. I'm not doing nothing. I'm seeking God. But when God speaks, that's where I'm saying tonight, you can't just do nothing. We must obey his voice would you stand with me tonight I would encourage us in this room in the closing part of this service to ask God to help us to hear his voice in regards to family in regards to ministry things in regards to church situations God help us to hear your voice and don't just pray to hear his voice but ask God to help you to have the follow through to obey that voice of God would you pray with me right now Lord Jesus we need you God, I've talked to us about moments in families, Lord, where it would be so easy to turn turn the eye, to turn the head and look the other way. But God, that's not your will. You want us to hear the Word of God tonight. You want us to obey your voice and to act upon those things. Help us, Lord, those that are watching online, those that are in this room tonight that need... Lord, direction, I pray, God, that you would help them tonight, God. We want to be people of action. We want to be people, Lord, that are following you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you lift your hands and love the Lord all across this place tonight? Hallelujah. Yes. Would you sing that tonight? Never let me go. Never let me go. I can hear him when I'm near to him. Yes. Lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm afraid No one else will do Nothing else can take your place. Oh, to hear the warmth of your embrace. Yes, Lord. Help me find the way. Bring me back, say, bring, bring me back to you. If you know it, would you sing it with us today? You're all I want. Oh. Sing it with us tonight. You're all I want. You're all I want. You're all I need. You're all I want. Help me know, yeah. Help me know you. Sing it one more time. Would you lift your hands with us? Let's sing it together. Lord, you're all, you're all all I've ever needed. You're all I've ever needed. Oh, you're all, you're all all I want. Help me, Lord. Oh, help me know you.
Would you thank him one more time for the closeness of his presence and for his word right now? Hallelujah. Come on, would you lift your voice and tell the Lord, God, I love you. I thank you today, Lord, for the closeness of your presence today. I don't want to take for granted, Lord, the word of God. I don't want to take for granted your presence, oh God, in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Thursday night, we'll have Throwback Thursday online. Friday night, there's a rally in Dyer, so we will not have First Lady Friday, Friday night. If you want to go to that rally, uh, it starts at 7.30, and it's at the church in Dyer, the United Pentecostal Church there. If you need directions or you need a ride or whatever, we can do that and make sure that uh, we get you there. You probably want to get there a few minutes early because uh, it's not just a really big place. And uh, I would encourage wearing a mask, that kind of thing, because I don't know how much social distancing will be available, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but we're looking forward to a great time back in here on Sunday. And uh, we're going to be talking about the God in between Sunday morning. And then Sunday night is our Bible study at 5 o'clock. We'll give a lot more details again on Sunday, what that's going to look like. Our teachers are going to have devotion together in the back. We need to pour into our Sunday school teachers. They're pouring into our kids. And so we're going to take some special moment with them in the back as well. It's going to be a great time together. Greet one another. Thank you for being here on this Wednesday night. God bless you.